time. Welcome back to another chapter in the great history of Rock Forever. We've got a very special guest. He goes way back. He's played on so many of your favorite records. He's got a new one himself. And we're going to talk about some of the uh, landmark recordings he's been a part of. Please welcome Kazim Sultan. Hey, everybody. Great to see you, man. I Good know um, so much of your history, you know, involves this character named Todd Rungren, who coincidentally is uh, being inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. Uh, yeah. Tell us tell us where you cross paths with, you know, Todd and, and what do you think it was about your your playing and your demeanor that uh, you guys connected on? Um, well, I, you know, I started working with Todd a very, very long time ago to date myself, I guess. Um, it was 1976. So just about 45 years ago, I started working with Todd. Um, I came into the band at, uh, at a time when, um, they were, they were more or less trying to transition out of, uh, uh of, a, of a quote unquote, uh, fusion prog rock band to a little bit more um, mainstream, a little bit more poppy, a little bit more, um, you, you know, accessible in terms of a three and a half minute song. Uh, and, and, and I kind of brought that sensibility to the band, I think, uh, with, with the, the, you know, with the music that I listened to that I gravitated towards. Um, I had no, no problem on those first few records or the first couple records playing the the prog based music but for the most part my heart uh real i was more drawn to the pop side and, and and the pop sensibility and i think that's that's what i brought to the band yeah well i know you got a lot of you know beatles and great great music you know in your dna and i'm sure uh you know todd wanted to expand the bass a little bit and hopefully get on the radio and, you know, uh, all of that. Now, was it simultaneously that you were playing in Utopia and also doing these sessions? Because we wanted to talk a little bit about your history with Meatloaf. Obviously, the Bad Had a Hell, you know, record with Todd and Jim Steinman and everything it came, came out of left field. You know, it, it was such an anomaly. I mean, when it was made, people didn't know where to put it. You know, they didn't, didn't radio didn't know what to do with it. And it ends up selling, you know, like 45 million copies. I mean, uh, talk, talk about how uh, Todd brought you into that project. Uh, you know, that was uh, Meatloaf. Um, when I say Meatloaf, I mean, Jim and me were were, uh, were brought to Todd through Moogie Klingman, actually. Um, Moogie uh, was friends with uh, Jim and uh, uh, and I guess knew Meat tangentially, I, I want to say. Uh, in any case, um, they were looking for a record, uh, a record deal, and they uh, were getting turned down uh, left and right. Um, somehow it wound up uh, on Todd's uh, radar. And, you know, Todd being the, uh, the, the, the kind of broad artist that he is, heard the music and said, I, you know, I think I might know what to do with this. Um, uh, financed the record himself. Um, and because Jim really was, he was the, 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 the writer, uh, he wrote all the music, all the lyrics, um, all the melodies and, uh, and he had a vision for the music, which was, he definitely felt that, uh, that it was more, uh, it, it, it kind of lent itself to Bruce Springsteen, Phil Spector that type of, uh, that, that, that genre of music. So he wanted Roy Bitten, who was uh, Bruce Springsteen's piano player in the E Street Band, and Max Weinberg, uh, the drummer, to play on the record. He knew he wanted Max and Roy on the record. He didn't have a bass player in mind. And that's when Todd said, um, well, maybe we can use uh, my bass player, the bass player from Utopia. Uh, and then I got the call to come in and uh, and play bass. So the record, really from top to bottom, the basic tracks and all the arranging were done by Todd, myself, Roy, and Max, um, with Jim kind of directing us. So that's how I wound up uh, being a part of that record, which 
you know, it, it is one of the biggest selling records of all time, which is a real feather in, in my cap. Yeah, well, well, like they often say, you know, being, being unique, you know, has a, has a lot of quality. You can easily be, uh, you know, lost in the shuffle because especially with the record labels, they're trying to follow up what's hot, what's trending, yeah. what's, you know, what's what, what radio is playing right now. They want to give more of that. And obviously that record had this, um, you know, definitely that uh, retro quality, like you say, with Spectre and yeah. Springsteen and, uh, you, you know, obviously Paradise by the dashboard light was, um, you know, the breakthrough. And, you know, unlike anything radio had ever played, obviously it was a long song. It was, you know, different. And, you know, Meatloaf was, you know, kind of known. Uh, uh, I don't even know if the Rocky Horror Picture Show was out by then. But yeah, you know, sure it was. Yeah. OK. But but obviously, like you say, he, he was the singer. You know, it was yeah. Jim Steinman's vision, Todd's production of specking the record out and um obviously like i say being that it was so from left field and unique it stood out so it had a chance to either be really big or a big bomb really fast and yeah well i mean you know i i really think that you you, you definitely have to give meatloaf uh, credit for um for his vocals on that record they were stellar vocals and uh and also i i think that that me being kind of the antithesis of what a rock star looked like in 1977. Um, I think that 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 spoke to a, a, an entire population of the disenfranchised and uh, of, of people who maybe, you know, didn't didn't picture themselves uh, as, a, 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 you know, as particularly pretty people. Not that Meatloaf is not a pretty person, but I think that that whole thing really helped them to, to find their own spot in, uh, in, in, a, in a crowded field of, uh, of, of music that was around at that time. Yeah, well, I know it was a slow burn to begin with, but just, yeah. you know, caught on slowly. But uh, like, like we always say, you know, um, if something comes in fast, sometimes it goes away fast and yeah. it, it kind of crept in and stayed here it's still selling on the charts and it's yeah it's like you say on one of the all-time all selling you know Correct. records of all time especially globally you know i mean yeah. the fact that it took off in europe and australia and canada and around the world was uh pretty remarkable so uh, i i know you came back for a bet out of hell too and, yeah. to, and toured with me and kind of became the music director you know it was quite a quite a band and and and, and singers Talk about the highlights of, of touring, you know, with Meat Low. Well, um, you know, I, I kind of lost touch with me and Jim uh, from the time that we had started um, doing Bad Out of Hell 2 in 1978 or 9, I think. Uh, as a matter of fact, I still have some cassettes behind me that uh, I, I would take uh, when we were doing basic tracks for, uh, for the second record. That record never came out. Uh, it never got done. As a matter of fact, most of that most of that record wound up becoming Jim's uh, solo record. In any case, um, so I really didn't have much to do with Meat between 1979 and 1991. Um, I had I, I had ran into Meatloaf in Australia. Uh, we were, Meat was there uh, for a softball tournament, and I was there with Hall and Oates. I was having breakfast one day in the in the restaurant in the hotel, and meets there, and he's like, "Yes, hi, how are you?" And I was like, "Great, how you doing?" I haven't hadn't seen him in a very very long time, um, and, and uh, I, he told me about uh, the new record that they were working on. I had already at that point I had already done some background vocals on "Bad Out of Hell" too, uh, but Meat wasn't around for those, so it was just myself. Todd and Rory Dodd up in um, Woodstock. So we did backgrounds for Bad Out of Hell 2 in 19, I think it was 1991. I ran into Meat Love. He said, you know, we're going out on the road um, it, uh, behind the new record. Um, do you have any interest whatsoever in, in maybe coming in and playing in the band? And I said, yeah, sure, give me a call. Uh, about a year later, he called me and uh, I wound up in the band for about 17 years. Uh, oh. 10 of which I was the musical director. Um, the great thing about uh, a, a 
hugely successful record is that you go from uh, from being on a bus with uh, with 13 other people and looking for a place to sit down to uh, a private plane and uh, and catering at the venue and uh, and five star hotels, which is very, very nice while it lasts. Um, and and so what, when Bad Out of Hell 2 became the huge hit that it was, and it's like uh, the, uh, it was, I think it was number one for about six weeks uh, uh, on, on the Billboard album charts. The single, I'd Do Anything For Love, was number one for, uh, I think it was 11 weeks. Um, I, might ha I might have those reversed, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But in any case, um, it makes a big difference to the, uh, the excitement that, that's involved and that surrounds all those kind of, uh, those tours and those shows. And, you know, 10 nights at Wembley Arena selling out every single night is just, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's rarefied air for sure. Yeah, you know, definitely. yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely um, moments, uh, you know, to remember. Now, obviously, you've played with so many other artists in between, but let's get back to Utopia. I know after uh, a couple initial records um, in in uh, from 76 on, you guys made the adventures in Utopia, which became the, the biggest selling record. Obviously, you sang the lead vocals on their only top 40 hit set me free number 27 on the charts. I was lucky enough. I was, um, the concert promoter at my university in, uh, Western Washington, right in between Seattle and Vancouver, it's called Bellingham. And we yeah, put on, yeah, yeah, we put on a show with you guys. We had a Jimi oh, Hendrix, uh, impersonator named Randy Hansen open. I don't know if that rang uh, a bell, but know, <laughs> you, you yeah. were probably tucked away somewhere, but, um, it was uh, it was a cool show. Obviously, the last city in America before you cross the Canadian border into Vancouver. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you guys blew us away. And, and, and obviously, the musicianship was uh, absolutely incredible. And, you know, uh, obviously, your your cohorts, not only Todd, but Roger Powell and Willie Wilcox goes into his, you know, drum solo on that crazy drum kit he had. And we're all yeah. blown away, you know. Yeah. That was a great band. I mean, we, you know, the, the chemistry in the band between the four of us was, uh, it was magical. Uh, it was, uh, you know, one of those things where it just all clicked and uh, everybody, we worked well together. We all played off each other well. We sang well. Um, the songs were, were great. And uh, we had a very, very good run for about 10 years. Wow. Well, talk about, you know, I know your song and you had several songs on that album. I think you sang lead on five of those songs. Uh -huh. um, how did uh, Set Me Free became a single? Was it Warner Brothers that picked that or uh, how did that you know, elevate to single status? You know, that's a, that, that's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, I, I believe um, I believe that the, the president of Bearsville Records at that time, because that record was on Bearsville. So the president of the record label was Mike Piloff, I believe, uh, in 1980, um, and which is, well, I think it was 79 or 81 Adventures came out when we did it. Um, and uh, of all the tracks on the record, uh, I guess w between Warner Brothers and Bearsville, Warner Brothers being the parent company, um, they decided that uh, that, that would, would have the best shot at radio. Um, and, and, and it just became the first single, uh, it was not anything that I said or did, or Todd said or did that, you know, uh, uh, I don't think anybody in the band, um, had, had anything, you know, any kind of like, well, it's, as far as we were concerned, every song on the record was good. So, um, that, that was a decision that was made for us. Yeah, well, it, was, it was it was the right decision. Absolutely. It, it was it was a spectacular experience for me still in college, working at college radio, you know, to put on a show like that with you guys and very, very memorable. To, so, so to see the success of that album, you know, working with Warner Brothers on the promotion of the show and everything, it was, uh -huh. uh, you know, I, I had my sight set on L.A. As soon as I graduated, boy, I was down the five freeway to, to okay. L.A. and, you know, 1980 drive. cents, you know. Yeah. But uh, I know you're mainly an East Coast guy, but um, do you remember the first time you came out to California and just 
saw the palm trees and the beaches and Hollywood and what your impressions were? Yeah, uh, the first time we came out was actually to shoot an album cover. Um, it was the Raw uh, record. Um, I had never been to California before. And, uh, and we were staying in, a, we, we had rented a house in the Hollywood Hills. Um, uh, I forget the, 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 the guy who owned the house. It was some famous guy, I don't know. Um, and we, uh, we spent um, a, about a week uh, out in LA uh, shooting the album cover, uh, which was photographed by um, a pretty famous photographer by the name of Norman Seif. Um, and, uh, and we went to um, Western Costume uh, in Hollywood to, to get all those Egyptian uh, uh, the, the Egyptian motif for the uh, record for the back of the cover. Um, and that was, you know, I had never been to, like I said, I'd never been to California before. I'd never really been out of the tri-state area between New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Um, so I was just, you know, I was 20 years old. <laughs> I was, I was having a wonderful, wonderful time. Yeah, the convertible. Dream- my dream was was being realized. Right, convertibles, all the girls everywhere, the palm trees. The, I, I don't remember this, that as much. I don't. I just. I don't remember that as much as, but, as but, it was. It was a complete whirlwind of like, okay, it's nine a.m. We got to be at at, at uh, the photographer. Okay, it's twelve o'clock. We got to be at the costume fitting. Okay, it's three o'clock. We got to do a press conference. That's pretty much all I remember of, of those uh, those first few tours uh, with the band and first few records. Well, I don't know what time of the uh, year that was, but you, you obviously heard from people like, hey, it's summer out here like all year round. You know, we don't we don't get snowed in. We're not shoveling ice. You know, it's really uh, a, a special, special climate. Yeah, well, I, I lived in L.A. for uh, uh, about a year and a half um, in 81 uh 81 yeah 81 or 82 um i lived there while i was doing my first solo record and uh uh, you know i uh some people from the east coast i have a ton of friends who are um la transplants san francisco los angeles uh, san diego santa barbara but for me um I, i i gravitate towards the east coast and that's where i am now yeah, well, you're a, you're a global guy. It's it's pretty amazing. After the "Set Me Free" song, all of a sudden you got this Canadian hit. You know, "Don't Break My Heart." How did that, that come about? First, well, that was from my first solo record uh, on EMI, um, and I, you know, I I worked very very hard to try and, and make uh, my my freshman effort at a solo record as good as I could possibly make it. Um, uh, it was, uh, I started off uh, recording the record with Roy Thomas Baker as the producer. Um, Roy and I had a, a differences of opinion and I switched from Roy to uh, Bruce Fairburn, who was uh, just the, the best guy in the, uh, on the planet when it came to production uh, and, a, and a brilliant record producer. Um, and, and, uh, and the record came out on EMI spent a lot of money on the record and uh um and we wound up getting a top 40 hit in canada from it wow well of course bruce fairborn being a canadian and really establishing that vancouver little mountain sound Mm -hmm. you know legacy i mean the bon jovis and aerosmiths and i mean yeah Yeah. everybody that came through there yeah um i mean all the way through ACDC, everybody was heading to Vancouver to record, you know, with Bruce uh-huh. or yeah, well, you know, Mike Frazier or any of his guys. Yeah, Bruce and I did the, the, did my record in Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I, I know he quickly thereafter established that uh, yeah that Vancouver yeah. thing, you know, and people yeah, well, people very, are wondering very, like, why is Bon Jovi going to Vancouver to record, you know? Yeah. Well, to work with Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was. Uh, Absolutely. Great, great times. Now, obviously, um, you had the opportunity playing with with Joan Jett in the Blackhearts, which, again, another Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. You know, we know Joan from L.A. She's the the real deal. You know, what were your um, highlights? You know, just being around, you know, somebody is, you know, uh, you, you know, crazy as Joan. I mean, she just had that 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 sound and, and that uh, no. Don't take no uh, shit attitude. 
Well, I, I, you know, I don't know that I would categorize Joan as crazy. She, Joan is, she's a laser beam. She's laser focused on what she does, how she does it, and who she does it with. Um, I, I, I could not have more respect for an artist than I do for Joan. Um, the time that I spent in that band as a Blackheart was it was a it was a really really cool time for me. Um, and and like I said, you know, working with Joan, she's very very serious. Uh, she takes her her art uh, and her performance very seriously, um, and d delivers every single night a hundred and ten percent. There is she is never like oh, I don't feel good. Oh, I'm not singing so right tonight. Oh, I you know this is the, the something's wrong. Or I, uh, uh, um, yeah, there's not enough people in the audience or whatever. No, no, it wouldn't make a difference if there was 10 people or 10,000 people. Joan, get the same show for, uh, for every, single, every single show that I ever played with. The, the highlight of working with Joan was having a, a top five hit with, uh, with Joan, uh, I Hate Myself for Loving You, which was on Up Your Alley. And, yeah, a uh, Desmond Child song. Yeah, and, well, Desmond, you know, I've been a friend of Desmond's for a very, very long time. And, uh, and when we did that record, um, uh, it, it was like, this is a great song. I, I, I hope something happens. You know, you never know. It's a lottery. It's, it, it, it's a, it, at best, a crapshoot whether a record is going to uh, take off or not. Um, and, uh, and that just was the timing was right. Stars aligned. And, uh, and Joan had a huge hit with it. Well, such a classic sound. And Joan always paid tribute to that. 70s glam era that you know mike chapman nikki chin uh, you yeah. know t-rex gary glitter sweet uh -huh. you know all, all, all of that she loved yeah, well, that I mean, you know she, that. Jones, she's a punk you know that's uh, that's the that's where she comes from uh she is uh her roots are in indie punk um uh you know uh, uh iggy pop uh and uh, uh, you know on some level early bowie um and uh, that the runaways, obviously. So Joan has a real punk sensibility to her, and, and she still does. Yeah, well, I worked with her on the uh, the Warp tour, you know, the big punk rock tour uh -huh. yeah. years later. And, and as, as the word crazy came out of my mouth, I always wanted to pull it back. It's she's focused. She, like you say, she's she's a laser yeah. beam. She'd be yeah. out there in a hundred ten degree, yep. you know, Absolutely. heat with Tommy yeah. Price and the band. And they're sitting in a parking lot, just sweltering. Uh -huh. And there's 80 other bands on the tour. And she had no complaints. Right. You know, exactly. she just needed exactly. to know what, what stage and what time, you know, it was... she, she is, she is so great. I, 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 I treasure the time that I work with her. Absolutely. Now I know um, you played for, for years with Loyster Cult. And of course that was, uh, you know, a supporting role, obviously the Joe Bouchard, you know, sound and all that. But, you know, I know the new cars was a, project that probably you guys had a lot of passion for and just you know wasn't totally accepted you know i know uh, obviously elliot easton and greg hawks you know uh had this idea of hey man you know the the cars were never uh you know a stellar live band we lost ben Orr, and uh rick okasic doesn't want to do it so right. brought todd and you in and of course prairie prince yeah. um i know you guys put your heart into that but for whatever reason, I don't know, between the label or radio or whatever, people just weren't ready for, you know, a new version of the cars. But what, what was the highlights of you, you know, for that project? Um, you know, I, I, I think it was a it was a very interesting project because it really wasn't, um, it, 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 you know, playing off uh, off of the success of the past sometimes can be a little tricky. And um, and it wasn't like it wasn't like the, the that band was coming up with anything particularly groundbreaking or new, uh, even though we did have, a, I think, about maybe a half a dozen to uh, seven or eight songs on a record that we did that was new material. Um, so so it was like it, we were trying to just kind of extend something that had already um had success and uh and it wasn't rick and it wasn't ben 
Um, it was me and Todd, and it wasn't Dave, it was Prairie. Uh, and I think that live, it was a very, very good band. And, and we did, uh, we, we sounded great. Um, unfortunately, we had built a bunch of momentum up uh, prior to the, uh, or, or during the first tour. And, uh, and we were on a bus and uh, the bus stopped short in the middle of a run. And um, Elliot, excuse me, Elliot um, wound up, uh, he was standing uh, at, at the front of the lounge, got thrown to the front of the bus and broke his collarbone in, in, in like three weeks into a seven week tour. And we had to cut the tour short. And that kind of took the, the wind out of our sails and, and uh, any momentum that the band had created up to that point uh, because we stopped uh, and we weren't, we weren't about to, we weren't prepared to replace Elliot. He was a principal. Um, so we, we kind of lost, uh, we lost a, a, a little bit of the, of the momentum that we had, uh, we had created up until that point. So it was sad. It, it oh, was yeah. really sad. That's, that's horrible, man. Those momentum killers. I mean, you know, if something happened to Prairie, you know, you could have brought in another drummer, but you know, uh, obviously with Elliot and, you know, Greg, to a lesser degree, they, they were the focal points to, to the past. Well, they, you know? that was the connection, you know, I mean, yeah. it was like if it wasn't for Elliot and Greg, then why call it the new cars? Right. And, Actually, and of Todd, course, the, car, the cars it. always used to get a knock that, you know, uh, Ben and Rick used to just stand there. At least you guys right. had some energy and, of yeah. course, uh, you know, brought it brought it live. And uh, I, I'm sure it was fun playing those old songs. But the new songs you made were were stellar. And I, I know a lot of people, you know, uh, kind of miss that project. They need to go back and, you know, there, there's so much underrated music. You know, we could have yeah. show after show of albums that weren't giant hits, but they're great. You got to go. You got to go check this out. You know, um, now, obviously, uh, coming to full circle with the solo career, we have Chasm 2021. Mm -hmm. And I know among all the great originals, you did a cover of the Nick Lowe song. What's so funny about peace, love and understanding that Elvis yeah. Costello made and everybody's covered that, you know, right. what what was the uh, the thought between, you know, covering that song? You know, I. Um... I, I did this entire record, uh, wrote uh, the record with, uh, with my good, good friend, Phil Thorn Alley, um, who is a, a, an amazing songwriter and, and just a great producer. Um, and I normally put, uh, a, do at least one cover tune on, uh, on, on my solo records. I've been doing that since for the last two or three records, I think. Um, so, uh, when it came time to, to kind of round out the record and see, okay, well, we have this kind of song, we have that kind of song. Um, so we, we, we kind of uh, knocked around a couple of, uh, of songs that I liked, that Phil liked. Um, and Phil suggested uh, What's So Funny About Peace, Love and Understanding simply because it was uh, on two levels. It was uh, a, a real up-tempo song. Uh, it was, we could heavy it up a little bit, which I tend to shy away from sometimes on my solo records. I, I tend to st stay a little bit more middle of the road. Uh, and Phil was pushing me to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, so that, would, that, that was a great song to get aggressive on. And the message, the message was, uh, was something that, you know, uh, it, it, it's come on guys, let's, we're all in this together. Let's let's just have a little bit more peace, love, and understanding. Yeah, the sentiment never gets old. What are your right. favorite originals on the album? My my favorite originals? Yeah. Well, I love them all. You know, I mean, they, they, they wouldn't make the record if I didn't care about the song. Uh, and and to to put them in um, in, in a pecking order is kind of like, well, what's your favorite child? You know, you have three kids. Who's your favorite? Now, well, let, let's put it this way. Uh, <laughs> talk about the single and why that was chosen as the, the first song. Um, the, the, the record company, uh, Deco Records, uh, who I'm, I, I'm so happy to be on, uh, on Deco Records for this, uh, for this album. Um, they, they suggested an, another song on the record. And I, uh, I kind of pushed for, uh, for the, the first single to be the song More Love. 
because uh, I thought it was a good example of what the record as a whole sounded like, um, what people could expect um, in general from the rest of the record, um, and, and the message, which was um, that the world, if the world needs anything right now, it's just more love. Now that sounds, a, a, you know, that might sound a little, um, uh, I, I, I'm not sure what the right word I'm looking for is, but it, it might be a little presumptuous on my part to, to boil it down to something that simple. But I think on some level that it, it, it really is that simple, that, that it, it's just, if we could just have a little bit more love in the world, maybe we might just get just that much closer to be all getting along, to understanding one another, to being a little bit more accepting of one another. Yeah, it's being idealistic. You know, you want to you want to uh, have great music, but you hope there's a little bit of a message in there, too. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's what you do as an artist. You know, I, I mean, there are certain things that, you know, uh, I would tend to say, um, you know, you want to make a judgment call on what this song is about. That's fine. I, I did my job. It's out there, you know, and, and now it's up to you to interpret it the way you want, because once you put a song out, it, it's like, it's not yours anymore. It becomes everybody else's, so. Well, I know you've got some select dates coming up. You've got a streaming event. We encourage everyone to check out Chasm Sultan online. Chasm 2021 is the album. That's the album, Chasm 2021. Yeah, and, and so much more great music to come. I know you're, you're always the Energizer Bunny, always working <laughs> on something. Yeah, there's you know, always something going on in my never world. Never standing still. So please, uh, all praise to the many, many years of uh, great music you've given us. And uh, we tell everybody, go go treat yourself to Chasm 2021 and uh, enjoy all that. Yeah, thank you very much.